Well, I'm going to be sharing some musings with you this morning, and um, if you don't get any good out of it, maybe hope it's not an indication of how much you prayed concerning it when it was in the making. In the book of Habakkuk is where we start. There's a few verses in this book that caught my attention. It got me thinking along the line of uh, what we'll call trustworthy or not. But the book of Habakkuk has to do with a nation that is ripe for God's judgment, God's foretelling some of the judgment that's going to be coming upon them. It's going to be some rough times coming judgment. And you have Habakkuk, which was a an upright individual, he was not the cause of the coming judgment, okay? But he was going to be there in the suffering. He was going to, to some extent, suffer along with everybody else. But in the very last chapter, the last three verses of the book, he is praying to God, and he makes a very profound statement. In verse 17, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hinds feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places. What a very barren situation to look forward to. If it was to the extent that there was nothing growing in the field, there was no livestock in the barn, well, that's your support. That's your sustenance. What are you going to live on? Um, that is a very bleak picture to look at. And yet, in the midst of that, he says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. It's like, well, what are you going to eat? Are you going to rejoice in God even when you have no food? How can you do that? That would be very difficult. I mean, we often get stumbled on a lot smaller things than that, don't we? I mean, maybe it's a rainy day and we wanted the sun to shine today, and so we get grumpy about it. It's like, um, what, are you, what are you upset about? Did God send the day? Did God see fit to send a rainy day? You know, why don't I accept it and make the best of it instead of being upset? But, but think about it. Here we have coming judgment. That was what God had foretold would happen in a situation like this. When the nation became so wicked, judgment would come. And famine and such was just part of that judgment. But that judgment was for the purpose of getting the people to repent so that they could then be in line to receive good from God. Um, that judgment was working towards the salvation of the nation. Like, well, how can you see that in a famine? How can you see the salvation of souls in the midst of such, such a physically bleak situation? And even if like with Habakkuk, he wasn't one that needed repentance, perhaps. He was right already in the sight of God. He was pleasing to God. But nevertheless, to see the promises of God being fulfilled, the judgment coming upon the nation, should help him to reinforce his own faith, his own confidence in God, and his own commitment to do right. One of the things to consider is, is God our only hope? 
If God is our only hope, then in a situation like this, we don't become bitter towards Him, do we? If we have some other hope, then we can feel like we can afford to be bitter towards God, because after all, we have some other route we think we can take that would do be produce better results. He mentions about hind's feet. And make me to walk upon mine high places. <coughs> what benefit do hind's feet have? Well, they're really handy when you're in high places. When you're in dangerous situations, they're very useful. Um, there's something that came to mind was, yeah, they're only really, their usefulness is only made manifest when you have a difficult situation that they're in. Then their beauty really shines. But otherwise, just for normal use, it, what's the advantage? Um, if a child learns to walk on a concrete floor, that's, that's a good thing to do. I mean, that's a big step in the right direction. Um, but that's something that almost everybody does. Almost everybody does that. If God moves you then to walking across boulders, now you've got a much smaller area where your foot has to set, and you have to get it landed just right, but you can learn to do that. I mean, the average person can usually learn to do that. It's more of a challenge, but eventually. If God was to require you to walk across slippery boulders, for you to successfully do that is really a demonstration of some excellent training, um, some help from God, perhaps. But how many people want to do it? Well, if God can, God can allow us to be in a situation where the physical setting is so bleak, there, there's no physical sustenance to look forward to, and we're praising God. That don't come natural. That really speaks for some type of training, some type of confidence um, in something other than your circumstances. Speaks of confidence in God way beyond what the average person has. But think about it. Rejoicing God in the midst of physically barren circumstances indicates a good degree of maturity. However, we find that in many situations, it's such circumstances where people become bitter towards God. And today we're going to look at some success stories and some failure stories. But, uh, but you occasionally read just in, in recent history of, well, maybe it's a tsunami comes through and your family's killed and you're the, you're the only survivor. And yet you were a Christian. Some people took it surprisingly well and other people become bitter towards God, become disillusioned. It's like, you know, I trusted in God that and see what happens. So their confidence in the goodness of God is then shaken. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we want to see some success stories here. People who were in challenging circumstances and responded very well. That it might be a a provoking of ourselves to not be over, overcome when we get into situations it's like, well, I don't see the goodness of God in this. I don't see how anything good can come of this. You've got to be careful because you can come, become bitter in such things and then nothing good comes of it for you. Mm -hmm. We have a man named Elkanah in 1 Samuel. And in verse 2 it says, And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of the, his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. 
the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her a fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? Then Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. Okay, it says that the Lord has shut up her womb. Her adversary, or the other wife, that, uh, also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. What a mean spirited woman! Make her fret. Fret against the Lord? What was that supposed to produce? Bitterness? Resentment towards the Lord? What would that help? Um, but to make her fret. To not trust. So here you have a situation where it says that the Lord shut, her, shut up her womb. She wasn't having any children. It was God's doing there. Naturally, she would have had children, but God had chosen to intervene, and she was not going to have children. And yet Hannah doesn't become bitter towards God. She sees God as the, her only hope. She didn't understand why, what was going on. But she understood that God wasn't to blame, but she, that God was... God had something in mind. And it's interesting that, yes, God withholding her from having children did not indicate his displeasure. In fact, he had something very special in mind that he was wanting to accomplish. He wanted to have a child, a special child, with a special work. And that child was going to be given to God from childhood. And how are you going to accomplish that except to get a mother to, first of all, realize that I'm not having children? I would really like to have a child. And if God would be pleased to give me a child, I would give him to the Lord from early on. And so God had a special work there that he was trying to accomplish, and Hannah came through very nicely with that. God was able to, to shape her and, and receive Samuel to use there in, as a prophet. But how many people in a situation like that become bitter towards God? If they knew that it was God that withheld them from having children, the tendency would, would be to become bitter towards God, not turn to Him and, and trust Him to, to work this all out well. We're very familiar with the account of Lazarus. Well, let's look at it anyway in Luke chapter 16. Talk about a similar situation to Habakkuk. Lazarus. I had quite a quite a test there. In Luke sixteen, nineteen. There was a certain rich man 
which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into the, this place of torment. Abraham said unto, saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. This was Lazarus's lot in life. For some reason, God had chosen this for him, or permitted him this to be his lot in life. And we look at it and think, from a physical viewpoint, what a miserable existence. You would like to be able to support yourself, at least have a place to sleep, you know, out of the weather. You would like to have better companions than these street dogs. Um, and you know, if, if God is your father, wouldn't he want better than that for you too? Could we maintain a trust and a confidence in God that he's working all things out for our good in a setting like that? Especially then when you see the rich man there, he has got plenty. Um, everything just seems to go well for him. But Lazarus's hard lot in life did not cause him to lose his confidence in the goodness of God. It's like... Oh, how can you maintain confidence in the goodness of God when all physical evidence speaks to the contrary? The rich man's wealth did not cause his faith to flourish. Lazarus's poverty did not earn him a place in Abraham's bosom. How would that work? I mean, Abraham was a wealthy man. And to have a necessity that poor people could only be the ones joining Abraham in that place doesn't make sense. But anyway, his poverty didn't earn it. Didn't really have much to do with it. Whether or not they heard Moses and the prophets seemed to be the determining factor of which place they went to. That was the solution for the rich man's brothers. They didn't, he didn't say, go back and tell them to get rid of everything they have so that they can also come here. No, he said, they need to give heed to what Moses and the prophets taught. And then they also can come to Abraham's bosom when they die. But the question is, where is my primary concern? Now or later? Lazarus's primary concern seemed to be for later, the eternal, the future. It, uh, the rich man's primary concern was the here and now. It's all about now. He thought the later would, would be fine. We think, what a sad, sad lot. 
for Lazarus to fill. But in the bigger picture, in light of eternity, Lazarus was successful in being faithful. He's eternally rewarded for it. The rich man's temporary pleasure is soon gone. Let's look at a failure in Exodus 17. But let's think a little bit about this failure. The magnitude of what was taking place. In Exodus 17, and all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. The people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Take it in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee upon, there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? <coughs> Okay, they, they journeyed according to the commandment of the Lord. They were doing what God told them to do. Let's just take a close look at the frustration here. They were doing what God told them to do, and they end up here out in the wilderness with no water. Now, could not God have foreseen that there was going to be no water there? So, we're doing what God told us to do, and he leads us right into a place where there's no water. And he knows that we need water, we can't live long without it. So immediately the mind becomes darkened, and you start to think. He did all those wonders in Egypt. He promised us a land flowing with milk and honey. So, okay, we agree. So we put our confidence in him. He leads us out into the wilderness. And now, no water. All the evidence points that God was simply trying to deceive us. And now he's going to kill us. I mean, after all, a God like we thought we had, he would know that there was no water here. So let's kill Moses. Oh. So God's not your only hope. In a tight spot, you're willing to ditch him and go some other direction. So your confidence in the goodness of God, in other words, that he's working good, has just been destroyed. Now, if you back up a little bit, let's look at the same situation from a little different perspective. God is preparing the children of Israel for the land of Canaan. And he wants to make sure they understand that they need to be looking to him for continual direction. Otherwise, he'll bring them into the land of Canaan and he won't be able to keep it because they won't live right. So he's got to Train them to depend on him. And that's what he's doing here. He's working for their good. And yet, 
They've lost confidence in the goodness of God because of all the physical evidence around them. So their trust has been replaced by fretting and getting close to just uh, falling back on plan B. In other words, we had it good in Egypt. We seemed to be able to take care of ourselves. We had trusted in God that he was going to have something better, but we see he's just going to kill us, so let's get rid of Moses, and things can be good again. What dark thinking. But somewhat understandable, unless you can somehow see beyond what seems like all the physical evidence, unless you have a confidence beyond that. But now, also consider, in the midst of this situation, you know, you're upset because of a lack of water. God brings some uh, young Philistine along that's wanting to hear about the true God. And he shows up in the camp here, and the people are on the verge of stoning Moses. Like, this young Philistine was wanting to hear about the true God, he's not going to hear it here. Because the people are very much fretting, their, their attitude is totally wrong, um, he, he's just going to be turned off. He's going to see that uh, the true God must not be here. Something to think about when we're in the midst of some challenging situation. God may be wanting to bring somebody to us, and we aren't going to be ready because we're grumbling. We're familiar with Joseph. But let's look at Joseph and see if we can get a feel for some of what he went through. And the, the wonder of it that he did an excellent job of conducting himself. In Genesis 37, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him, and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brethren said, uh, said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for the, his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him, and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and my, thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying, You see how these dreams that God gave to him helped fuel the hatred in his brother's hearts towards him. <coughs> and yet, those dreams were in some ways a mercy for Joseph to help him to not lose heart in the midst of some of the coming years, perhaps. It could have been an encouragement to him in those challenging years, or it could have served to embitter him. Because as you ponder that these dreams that God gave to me, and I shared with my brothers, 
are part of the reason why they got rid of me like they did. They're one of the things that helped fuel their animosity towards me and cause them to sell me. And then I end up down here in Egypt. So that which seemingly in the short term maybe it was an encouragement maybe it seemed like it made life very difficult for him in the long term um, it came true perfectly in 30, chapter 39 you see, this is after Joseph's brothers sold him. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. You know how sometimes you get your hopes up only to have them dashed? Can you imagine how he must have been thinking here? Like, I remember those dreams. And here, it's interesting how I'm sold into Egypt. An officer of Pharaoh's guard, he buys me. I become his servant. We're doing quite well here. He put me in charge of his entire household. I can see how this... This could eventually lead possibly to the fulfillment of these dreams that I had. Um, because, you know, servant of the captain of his guard, that, that's up there pretty good. Yeah. And then to have him unjustly accused, put into prison, that would have been an excellent opportunity to have become bitter become discouraged and just totally, you know what? I, I, I give up. I don't trust God anymore. But he didn't. He didn't. And in verse 21, he, so he's thrown into prison, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in his the, in the prison, and whatsoever he d they did there, he was the doer of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Yeah, but it's the prison. I mean, <laughs> I, was, I was hoping for some position where my family could eventually come and acknowledge that, you know, I was over them, but I'm going the wrong way, it seems like. <coughs> Um, so then, okay, they're in the prison, then the chief butler and the chief baker, they get in there and they have their dreams. <coughs> and Joseph tells, tells uh, chief butler what his dream means, and oh, the man's really happy about it. And sure enough, it comes to pass as, as Joseph said it would. And, and Joseph tells the chief butler in 40... Verse 13, let's see. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and there, here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. <clears throat> Finally, I, I can see how this, 
I mean, this man who stands before Pharaoh, this may, this may be productive yet. Two years. I mean, you get your hopes up and dashed again because a whole year went by and then a year and a half is like, I don't know what's going on. I just have to keep on being a good prison manager. So two years, two years went by, and then Pharaoh has a dream. In chapter 41, verse 14, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment, and came in unto Pharaoh. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. You know, he wasn't, he not only wasn't bitter towards God, he held God in high esteem. And he said, he told Pharaoh, God shall give you an answer. What an example. He had his hopes up and down, but his confidence in the goodness of God seemed to, he clung to that. God was his only hope. And, and that was, he did a good job. We're also familiar with, in Job, so let's look at Job a little bit as well. Talk about another bleak situation. He had a very good, very comfortable or very uh, materially well-off position. But in Job chapter 1, verse 6, maybe we'll just... Uh, Skim over that a little bit. We had a certain day when Job lost everything, all his material possessions and his children. All in one day. But in the end of chapter 1, it says, Then Job arose, and rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not with, nor charged God foolishly. Job, didn't you realize it was the devil who took it away? Well, what difference does it make? God obviously granted permission. He gave the okay. So whether God took it or whether he gave permission, what difference does it make? It's gone. And if God saw that that was the best thing to do, and I don't believe that God just enjoys seeing pain, blessed be the name of the Lord. I mean... But Satan wasn't content with that. So then he comes back and gets permission to afflict Job's body. Make him physically miserable yet too. And he took a pot shirt to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Can we only trust him when he's doing pleasant things for us? Is that the only thing we can receive from him? Or can we not also receive things that are unpleasant? 
Do we think that somehow if it, things become unpleasant that somehow he, his nature has changed? You want me to not retain my integrity? My integrity is really the only thing of value I have left. Why throw it away too? My integrity having to do with my, my adherence to moral principle. Oh, yes, if the devil could get you to throw away that, that would just be his ultimate in victory. But no, I'm not going to get rid of my most valuable possession that I still have. All my material wealth and such I was going to leave sooner or later. My body is going to decay sooner or later. But let me not lose my integrity. Let me hold that to the end. And you know, he says, shall we receive good and not evil from God? It's like, yes, when everything's going well, we can think things through, and it's like, well, that is an excellent principle to live by. Yes, of course, if you can trust God, um, when he's doing you good, why don't you trust him when he's doing harm, too? It's easy to say. But when you're, when you're right in the midst of the, of the dark time, it's a challenge to operate that way. To not become bitter. We have some words of Jesus in Luke chapter 14. We want to look at. Luke 14, verse 25. There went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, can, he cannot be my disciple. How do we know what it will cost us? I mean, is it going to cost us an arm and a leg? What's it going to cost? And I don't think that's the point. I think the point is, we need to be fully persuaded, willing to give everything that we have to see this be accomplished. So that, with well, the example given about counting the cost before you start building the tower. If you're not firmly committed to seeing it through to its conclusion, you're likely to get out there and start digging for the foundation, and it'll be a hot day. And you'll be having some second thoughts. It's like, you know what? We're just working on the foundation. And I'm, I really don't think this tower idea is really for me. Um, I think maybe I'd rather be um, somewhere else and just give up the whole tower idea. But what you need to do is you need to Count the cost ahead of time. Realize, you know what, this is going to be a lot of hard work. It's going to be a lot of hot, out in the sun. But it's something that I'm supposed to do. And I'm going to do it till it's 
If it takes me till I die, so be it. Sitting also about meeting him that comes against you at 20,000 people. It's the time to make the decision about whether or not, whether you're going to surrender or fight is when you have time to think it through clearly. Consult with your captains. Do we have a strategy that's going to secure the victory? Yes, we do. All right. We're not going to rethink this, this decision. So that when the enemy come and they're outside your walls and they got 20,000, you don't be, be swayed by, you know what? They've got two for every one of us. There's a lot of them out there. You know what? What were we thinking? In the good times are when we need to examine the evidence. When we need to decide if we're going to trust God all the way to the end or not. And then when the times get tough, that's not the time to rethink your commitment. We need to make our commitment based on fact, not on the feeling. In other words, look at clearly at the evidence and not wait until we're confronted with the crisis to make our, our decision. Because then our, our feelings are going to greatly affect our ability to properly keep going. But God's plan is the very best, and all of our resources need to be available for its fulfillment. <coughs> but the question for us is, will we trust him past the last exit? Hmm? In other words, can I only trust him as long as I have uh, another option? In other words, if it seems like God's not going to come through, that I could take this route. Am I willing to leave that last alternative behind and not panic? In Hebrews 12, it talks about chastening. God's chastening. And it's an important thing to consider because oftentimes those tight spots can actually be God's, God chastening us to shape us into something very useful. And so our natural tendency is to want to somehow avoid those tight spots. Um, there's a tendency to become bitter during those testings, those chastenings. And yet, and to, to question the goodness of God in such a situation. But it's the goodness of God that has brought us there. Because he's wanting to produce something useful. He's wanting us to grow into something uh, valuable. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, where all are partakers, and are you bastards and not sons? Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. In other words, we received their correction well, made use of it. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For the, they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward... It yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. The challenge there to be 
have that confidence so that we're not destroyed by the chastening, so that we not be, don't become bitter by it, but are able to receive the good that God has in mind on the other side of it. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is be lame be, uh, be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau. There we had a matter of appetite versus birthright, didn't we? Esau was in a, a very hard situation. He was very hungry. He felt like it was just more than he could take, especially when he smelled some of that good soup that Jacob had. The more he smelled that, I think the the more faint he felt and the more he felt like he just had to have some. Whereas the birthright is like, what, how does that affect today? The birthright is way down the road somewhere. Um, but that's the controversy that we're faced with. Extremely hungry. You know, a, a test. It's like, you know, God could have made Esau be successful in his hunting. God could have provided Esau for, you know, with that food. But for some reason, God saw fit that Esau didn't get anything that day. And Esau was hungry. Was God working for Esau's good? Hmm. I think it's important to take care of my appetite, my today. But what about the future? It's like, well, what about the future? I'm sure we'll get something figured out when we get there. <coughs> it's not a very good view to have of the future, especially when we look at it, the future as far as Judgment Day and such, that our, our focus would be more, more on today. Well, how do I feel today? That's setting us up for a similar fate like Esau had. He found no place of repentance, so he sought it carefully with tears. When that time came, it was too late, late to change. Change what was going to happen. But as Christians, we kind of have a birthright as well. As a Christian, you have the birthright of being in his image and finally dwelling in his presence. The question is, how much do we value it? How much are we willing to jeopardize that for the sake of getting us out of a temporary hard spot? Or, yeah, questioning the goodness of God that has brought the chastening or into our life. The Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, makes a very interesting statement that I thought ought to be a part of these, these verses to think about. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. <coughs> Now, if these trials, these testings are 
God, God's way of accomplishing something in us or through us that is a much greater value than that which it is presently costing, why should we become bitter? This is a unique opportunity to trade something of lesser value for something of greater value. If we have enough confidence in God's goodness to carry us through. But think about it. This was Paul saying this. And some of the things he went through, for him to call it a light affliction, it's like, oh, what kind of afflictions do we have then? If yours were light, um, I don't know if my afflictions are worthy of being called that. In Acts chapter 20, a couple more verses. Paul's talking to the Ephesian elders, I believe. Acts 20, 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel, the grace of God. The, the Holy Ghost witnesses that bonds and afflictions, that's what he had to look forward to and pretty well everywhere he went. It's like, how long could you keep that up before you would become just, you know what, what's the point? But Paul's physical comfort was far less important than finishing the transformation course that God had planned for him. Paul was confident, it's like, you know what? God has told me that this is pretty well what I have to look forward to everywhere I go. Um, but obviously, in the long term, that's going to work for my good. That's going to somehow produce something of much greater value than my present comfort would have anyway. So, I'm going to keep going. This mindset will help us press forward when God's path seems dark and lonely. In other words, if you find yourself in a situation it's like all the physical evidence points towards that God's simply working to destroy me. In a situation like that, our primary concern probably should be God's will. What is God's will for us? Is that what I'm doing? Then his discernment, you know, if he and his wise discernment has discerned that this is the best way to accomplish what needs to be accomplished, and he is good, he's working for good, then let's go. Let's keep going. So even though in the midst of those discouraging situations <clears throat> the tendency is to feel resentment towards the one who has the power to have just done things managed things totally different um, that's really not a good time to turn your back on that's an excellent opportunity to show to him that you believe in his goodness you have confidence Conf far more confidence in his ability to bring things out right than you do in your own. So, I hope it can be a blessing to you to think about that. Maybe also somewhat of an admonition that as we encounter disappointments in life, we need to be careful how we deal with them. We need to make sure our response is correct because it is saying something. God's, God's getting feedback from our responses to the things that He brings into our life or allows in our life. 
And it may indicate to him that, you know what, there's an area here that needs a lot more work. Um, and if he sees that, and then it's bringing a lot more work, or a lot more conflict there, or a lot more uh, shaping, to, to be confident that, you know what, there must be a lot that needs to be accomplished there. Because I'm sure that God's not making it any harder than he needs to, but he wants to make sure the job gets done right. And I want to see that same thing too. I want the job to be done right too. And I know he knows how to do it. And I trust his judgment in that matter. The word bitterness was mentioned a number of times. Bitterness is always blaming. A person who is bitter is blaming. If you never blame, you will never get bitter. If you're continually focused on the Lord, determined that He is going to work this all to your own good, determined that uh, His way is best and He has a plan, and you're just going to stay right with Him. You'll never get bitter because you're not blaming. Mm -hmm. A lot of people actually use the term bitter as though it justifies their wayward course. <clears throat> I was bitter with my parents, therefore that's why I did this or that. I was bitter against uh, circumstances, so I was justified in being bad, basically is what they're saying. Um, but bitter is always blaming. It's not taking personal responsibility and realizing that regardless of what happened, regardless of what happened, there's no one to blame. And it wouldn't do any good if I did blame. And what I need to do is focus on what does God want me to do now? What does God want me to do in this situation? So if there was someone else who did me wrong, I can focus on the wrongdoer or I can focus on the Lord and say, what do I do from here? Focusing on the wrongdoer is going to cause bitterness. Focusing on the Lord and what do I do now is going to bring a, a purpose. Let's stand together.